All right, we're going to look at Elegy 19 by Dunn, uh, his, the most famous of his elegies, uh, subtitled To His Mistress Going to Bed. Uh, we're going to find that this elegy is rather uh, contrary to one's expectations of what an elegy would be, because there's very little elegiac about it. And we're also going to find that having uh, just dealt with a number of his holy sonnets, we are now moving back from one extreme to the next. We began with the flea, which was very much in the same sort of vein as this particular poem. Uh, some of the features that it bears in common with that poem and all the others are the idea of the uh, courtly lover, here rather shorn of the uh, courting and the conventions of it. There's very little, by the way, of romance, once again, just like in the flea. Uh, and more, the situation is of interest to Dunn. Dunn presents himself in very rakish terms. Uh, we also can see in this poem uh, the microcosm, macrocosm uh, analogy being employed regularly in the poem. But uh, let me share the screen here, and I'm going to read the poem. I think it's always helpful to read poetry aloud. I think it has uh, helps bring it to life. <clears throat> We're going to see that it is presented in a the form of a series of rhyming couplets as well. But as I say, this is Elegy 19, to his mistress going to bed. And let me read it. Come, madam, come. All rest my powers defy. Until I labor, I in labor lie. The foe, oft times having the foe in sight, is tired with standing, though he never fight. Off with that girdle, like heaven's zone glistering, but a far fairer world encompassing. Unpin that spangled breastplate which you wear, that the eyes of busy fools may be stopped there. Unlace yourself. For that harmonious chime tells me from you that now it is bedtime. Off with that happy busk, which I envy, that still can be and still can stand so nigh. Your gown going off such beauteous state reveals as when from flowery meads the hill's shadow steals. Off with that wiry coronet and show the hairy diadem which on you doth grow. Now off with those shoes and then safely tread in this love's hallowed temple, this soft bed. In such white robes, heaven's angels used to be received by men. Thou, angel, bringst with thee a heaven like Mahomet's paradise. And though ill spirits walk in white, we easily know. By this, these angels from an evil sprite. Those set our hairs, but these are flesh upright. License my roving hands and let them go. Before, behind, between, above, below. Oh, my America, my newfound land, my kingdom safeliest when with one man manned. My mine of precious stones, my empery, how blessed am I in this discovering thee. To enter in these bonds is to be free. Then where my hand is set, my seal shall be. Full nakedness, all joys are due to thee, as souls unbodied, bodies unclothed must be. To taste thy, joy, thy whole joys, gems which you women use are like Atlanta's balls, cast in men's views, that when a fool's eye lighteth on a gem, his earthly soul may covet theirs, not them. Like pictures or like books, gay coverings made for laymen are all women thus arrayed. Themselves are mystic books, which only we, whom their imputed grace will dignify, must see revealed. Then, since that I may know, as liberally as to a midwife, show thyself, cast all, yea, this white linen hence, there is no penance due to innocence. To teach thee, I am naked first. Why then what needs thou have more covering than a man? So what we see here in Mr. Dunn, Dr. Dunn, 
is uh, of the same order as we saw back in uh, the flea. We have an encounter between a man and a woman, and the purpose of the encounter is uh, to uh, is sexual. And he speaks to his mistress, but he speaks to her as a madam, uh, someone with a, uh, a little bit more maturity about her, perhaps. The time of composition is unclear. Uh, it was refused uh, publication in 1633. It was not given license um, and first printed in 1654 in the Harmony of the Muses and included in a, an edition of Dunn's poems that came out in 1669. Um, I think we can see why it was refused a license. If one was going to refuse a license, then the subject matter might uh, merit that here. Um, because it seems almost wholly um, licentious in its uh, language and uh, understandings. And remember, this is in the middle of the Puritan era, 1633. Uh, and, and it is what it is. Um, the, uh, um, am I right? Am I getting right about this, that it was refused publication? Have I mistaken that? No, it was. Um, and uh, it's, uh, its subject matter is pretty clear. There's no way of not reading it as anything other than what it is. It does nonetheless have um, some features that I think are worthy of note. So the beginning, let me put it back on the share screen here, the beginning of the poem. Um, as again, the encounter between the man and the woman, the woman who he is trying to persuade to uh, divest herself of all articles of clothing. Uh, what we don't know at the outset is that he is already in that state himself. Um, that's an interesting twist to the turn of the poem. Um, so it's a closing gambit rather than an opening one. We do note uh, repeated um, imperatives in the poem. Um, from the beginning, come, madam, to the repetition of this phrase, off, off with that girdle, off with that happy busk, off with the wiry coronet, etc. So a repeated uh, command to remove uh, or divest herself of clothing. References to labor, here in the second line, um, and uh, sort of a, a contrast between uh, rest and labor, uh, labor in a dual sense. Men labor in the sense that they work and till the soil in the sweat of their brow. Um, but the, the dual connotation, of course, is that women are in labor. Um, so until he labors, does his work, he, he is in the pangs of labor, he's suffering, he's in torment, playing on a sort of a feminine under, understanding of himself. He is, in, he is in the throes of pain until he is able to do his work. In this case, his work is upon her. <clears throat> and, the, and then makes a spiritual reference, uh, I think reference to Ephesians 6 verse uh, 12, 13 and following. Uh, putting on the armor of God, and then in and then to the command to stand, having put on the armor of God to simply stand firm um, against the wiles of the enemy, the enemy being not flesh and blood, uh, as it would be here, but rather the spiritual powers uh, in the heavenly realms. Um, Dan is alluding to that here. The foe oft times having the foe in sight is tired with standing though he never fight. Um, off with that girdle. Now, the girdle is something of what you'll wear around your, your midriff. Uh, Dunn sees this now in cosmic terms, talks about the zone, the heaven's zone, the zone in, in Greek, referring to the girdle, as well as to the, uh, uh, the, the heavens themselves. So he's seeing her as a, on the macrocosmic level and describes her in uh, such terms as well, um, which is uh, cosmological, but it's also stock associations for courtly love poetry, where women are compared to 
uh, angels, heavenly bodies, their bodies to these sort of having cosmological or even metaphysical significance. So he goes through an array of those sorts of references. Um, she has a girdle like heaven's own glistering, but a far fairer world encompassing. She is like the macrocosm, yet far more fair than it. These are stock courtly love conventions. Unpin that spangled breastplate, which you wear, that the eyes of busy fools may be stopped there. He being the busy fool in this case. Unlace yourself for that harmonious chime. I'm told a uh, reference in the footnotes here that in um, <clears throat> certain uh, uh, breastplates, uh, there is a clock in it as well that chimes. And that's the what he's referencing here. That harmonious chime tells me from you that it is now bedtime. Um, off with that happy busk. The busk is a corset of sorts, which I envy, of course, because it's around her, close to her, that still can be and still can stand so nigh. They uh, often constructed in whalebone, the corsets, and of course that stiffens them and presents them uh, so that you even take it off, it still can stand upright beside her. Uh, your gown going off, such beauteous state reveals as when from flowery meads, the hills shadow steals, all manner of allusions um, in the world compared to her. Note that the comparisons are visual and also in terms of value, but mostly visual. This is this imagery. I mean, we could draw a comparison between Dunn's uh, erotic poetry here and that which we see in Song, Song of Solomon. Uh, and we would note if we did that, that uh, whereas here it is visual and there is an it's analogous in terms of a visual field of reference in the Song of Solomon, it isn't so. It's more uh, something of value and, and uh, that the poet refers to. So women's breasts being compared to the Towers of David. This is not a visual comparison. It's uh, referring to something that is of value to the people of Israel and to the uh, to Solomon himself, of course, this is something that he is very pleased with. Likewise, uh, his beloved, um, but that's not a visual reference. Nor are the sh uh, you know the teeth like sheep coming up from the dip. Sheep dip makes them brown. She doesn't have brown teeth. Uh, it's again a, a, a visual image um, for us. For them, it's an image of that gives uh, delight more than that. But Dunn is using the, the regular European connotations of a visual image. And so he will make all of those here in that sense, more in an empiricist sense, we might say. Um, but And so uh, off with that wiry coronet and show the hairy diadem which on you doth grow. So she has a, a coronet made of wire, which is in her hair. Take that off and then you already have a natural crown. He's making the comparison between the natural crown and the artifice, which she had was in the form of the wiry coronet. He says that she, her nature is superior to it, preference of nature for, uh, to that of art, uh, which is a sentiment that will grow uh, over time, particularly when we come to the romantic period where it becomes a strict dichotomy. But here, that hairy diadem, diadem is superior off with the shoes and then safely tread in this love's hallowed temple, this soft bed. Remember in the flea, it was the body of the flea. Here it is actually a bed. One uh, imagines at any rate. In such white robes, heaven's angels used to be received by men. Now, presumably reference to uh, Genesis 17, uh, and not a reference to uh, the illicit uh, Nephilim um, being used uh, here. I think not. Um, but there, in that case, not a, a negative image at all, a positive one. He moves that from that to a reference which would be known to him because of the uh, context here, uh, a Muslim reference. Um, and, and here it has the connotations of sexual, uh, not just sexual delight, but sexual excess. So in Muhammad's paradise, note the spelling here, um, very common in Dunn's day, 
uh, it was said that they're in the Hadith at any rate, not the Quran, but in the Hadith, it is said that um, those of Muhammad's followers uh, will receive in heaven 70 uh, wives uh, as reward. I guess that says something about uh, the nature of those who are saved in Islam it must be must be men, one presumes that, um, because they will receive this, this uh, reward of seven, 70 wives, as it were, and have the strength to manage to do that. In fact, the strength of 100 men. Um, that uh, Dunn invokes that here um, as a ground of comparison, a heaven like Muhammad's paradise, and though ill spirits walk in white we easily know remember the devil can uh clad himself in uh angelic guise we easily know by these this these angels from an evil sprite those set our hairs and this our flesh upright a rather vulgar reference uh here and if you don't understand it i'm not going to explain it but i think it's pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, at any rate, on with the imperatives. License my roving hands. And where will the hands go? Everywhere, before, behind, between, above, below. Um, maybe a vague reference to the, uh, the love of God. How deep, how wide, how high, how long. The love of God, here he's making an analogy to his love and how it will be expressed. He speaks of her in terms of being a uh, newfound land. Oh, America, America Vespucci. Um, she is a newfound land. My kingdom safely is from when one with one man manned. Now, again, obviously sex, sex, sexual in its connotations. My mine of precious stones, my empery. How blessed am I in this discovering thee. To enter in these bonds is to be free. Then where my hand is set, my seal shall be. All of these are clear sexual uh, allusions, if not um, quite obvious at that. Uh, in the set, so note, there are three sort of movements here. The first, come, madam, come. The second, license my roving hands. The third, full nakedness. So again, like in the flea there, where there are three discrete stanzas, here there are three movements. And then it concludes with to teach the I am naked first. As I say, it has a, a very uh, sort of different conclusion there and the unexpected conclusion there. But the third movement, full nakedness. So the first two stanzas where he is encouraging her to disrobe herself and then to license his hands to wander, um, leading up to the third, <clears throat> uh, one would expect there to be a, um, a, a climax here. Literally, in, in certain senses, there's going to be sexual consummation. That's not how it ends, despite the full nakedness. So he's visualizing here rather than uh, experiencing. This is not a descriptive, it's a visual uh, image that he is projecting forth. And it's almost like he has a dream sequence uh, from which he awakes there at the beginning. So he begins in the flea with Mark, but this flea, here he concludes with, look at me, here's my state. Uh, so they should be seen in, as companion put pieces in that sense. That's why I put it towards the end of the uh, section on done it's a it's to see, be seen as a sort of a book ending of the themes of done here full nakedness all joys are due to thee now in the anglican book of prayer in the marriage rite, it uh one of the uh, vows that is taken that uh is that with my body i thee worship which always struck me as rather surprising um that uh, the the language of worship was used for bodies but nonetheless it is there and, uh, and very much reflects the part, uh, the interesting aspect of, of Christianity, which is the full uh, delight in the physical aspects of marriage. It's not something to be uh, simply uh, 
suffered uh, as a necessity for childbearing. It is to be seen as something which is an act of worship in itself, in, the, in a way analogous to the love of God. Similarly, so agape love, similarly, there's erotic love and uh, friendship love and familial love. All of these loves are analogous to one another. Um, and so that's fully articulated in that marital vow. Dunn expresses the same here. Uh, and then makes various comparisons uh, using here a sort of platonic image, the idea of the body and the soul being unbodied um, in a sort of a dualistic way. Dunn, like many of his era, is happy to employ Neoplatonism as it suits him without actually committing to it because it's heretical. Um, in the same way here, moves on to the, uh, to the mythology of Atlanta. Atlanta, if you didn't know, uh, was held to be so swift that no man could catch her. And she rejected all suitors who would not beat her in a foot race. But she was defeated by Hippomenes, not mentioned here, uh, who dropped three balls, golden balls that had been given to him by Aphrodite. And Atlanta stopped to pick one up and thereby was beaten uh, here. Um, here, uh, the balls which cast in men's views, um, uh, the analogies being made here. Uh, likewise, uh, a book, a mystic book, uh, words of power to unlock spells. Uh, uh, and in this case, the, the, the mystic book is given an analogous uh, field of reference to the book of grace because imputed grace is being referred to. Calvinist reference here. Uh, in which God is revealed here, uh, uh, she is, or we are revealed here in this act, in this union, which he's imagining for himself. Then, since that I may know as liberally as to a midwife, show. Now we get really here, this is, um, I mean, if it's not explicit, how could it not be more explicit than this? Um, as a mid to a mid midwife, show thyself. Well, I think we can imagine for ourselves the postulate of a midwife, and there will be no uh, barrier to Dunn himself. But having got to that point, which he has built up to to this point, he concludes rather shockingly with the idea that none of her cloth clothes has been removed. She's divest divested herself of no garments whatsoever. And the only one who is in this state is done himself. He is leading the way, as it were, to teach thee first, I am naked first. Why then, what needs thou have more covering than a man? Uh, no sense of this at the outset of Dunn's state. Um, so in a way, you can see this as a parallel, but also a contrast to the uh, approach that he used in the flea. I think it works rather well. It is the most famous of his elegies, and I thought it added a little bit to the full array of poetry that Dunn presents to us for me to deal with it as one of the last poems that we will handle for Dunn before moving on to George Herbert.